also um, Daniela Soria here to provide Spanish interpretation. So if anyone would like those services, I'd like to invite uh, Daniela up. Entonces, si alguien necesita uh, interpretación en español, tenemos los equipos allá en la parte de atrás y pueden venirlos a recoger con libertad y los vamos a programar al canal cuando sea que ustedes necesiten. Gracias. So thank you all for considering uh, your questions well and being patient this evening and lis listening well as uh, an addition. Thank you. And Tim and I will be working together to keep the candidates on track. Um, we have a device that the candidates can see that will be counting down the time and we'll give them signals when they have 30 seconds left in 10 seconds. And if everything works as well as it did last night, there won't be a single problem, except when the candidates can't get all of their answer in, in, 90, in 60 seconds. So we'd like to start this evening. I'll introduce our candidates. We have from your left, my right, Richard Ball, Dina Reed, Paul Summers, and George Hirschman. And you're going to be hearing from each of them in turn. And we'd like to start with the opening two-minute uh, opening remarks, starting with Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Ball. I got elected to city council in 2008. When I first ran for council, a lot of what I talked about and where I wanted to see us make progress focused on planning and helping city government be more open and inclusive. So I decided to run for office, talk about these things, and see if enough people agreed with me. Having been in office for eight years, I find I'm more and more amazed at how we look at politics. Even those of us who are the most informed tend to look at what canvassing is promising about this and that. If we like what we hear, we tend to lean in that direction. What amazes me is that none of us are running for king. I can't think of many elected offices where the day you're sworn in, you just start to get to start telling everyone what to do. So when I try to put that in the context of serving not in some big state or national office, but on a council for a city of 50,000 people, I wouldn't be serving the citizens very well if I didn't try to listen and learn. And here's one thing I kind of knew before I got elected, but I really know now. You're one person on a five-member council. You can have the best idea in the world. By itself, that gets you a platform to make a few speeches that no one outside of Harrisonburg is ever likely to know about. I think most would agree that there have been some positive things happening in Harrisonburg these last eight years. My main point is that there's no accomplishment these last eight years where it makes sense to me that I would try and do anything but take full credit. I haven't built anything, but we have. With that, I hope you'll consider supporting me in the coming election. Look forward to answering questions and doing anything else you would find helpful this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And next, we're going to hear from Dina Reed. Hello. I am Dina Reed, and I am the program director of On the Road Collaborative, which is an after school program at Skyline Middle School. I am in this race because I want to make a difference in my community. I was born and raised here. Harrisonburg is the foundation of who I am. I am a product of Harrisonburg City Schools. I care about our residents, I care about our community, and I care about our children. I want to make sure our city continues to provide quality education for our kids. I want to make sure we provide adequate space and make sure our schools are safe. I am concerned about our overcrowded high school. I am concerned about the frustrations our families and teachers and students have expressed. This is not just a school board issue, it is a community issue, and most of all, it is a city council issue. I am in this race because I want all of our, all of our voices to be heard. I believe there are people who call Harrisonburg their home, but they do not feel a part of the city. I want to change that. I am in this race because it's time to have a woman's voice on city council. Women make up over half of our population and our voice needs to be represented. I'm in this race because we are a city of diversity. We say diversity is our strength. People of color are 30% of our city, yet our city leadership does not reflect that. I'm in this race to build healthy and positive relationships between community and city. I'm in this race to make sure we stay a vibrant city that people not only come to live, but stay. Education, community, and growth is my platform. All three is significant, for us to successfully progress in our city. We need city council to take the lead, and I am in this race to ensure we do. Thank you, Dina. 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 Thank you,
Dina. Next, we're going to hear from Paul Summers. Uh, I'm not from Harrisonburg, but I've grown to love the city of Harrisonburg a great deal. I first came here in 2000 for school. I went to Blue Ridge and James Madison University. I moved away, taught middle school for a couple years, and finished graduate school in North Carolina, and then happily returned to Harrisonburg where since 2007 I've been very involved in the arts community and in the service industry community and um, just recently opened a restaurant here on Main Street just over this way called the Golden Pony. So Harrisonburg is a, is a place that I'm very, very invested in and I want to do more. I want to help pro progress the city of Harrisonburg and create an uh, environment that is conducive to all the things that I love about the city that are already here. And I think we have some very serious issues coming up on the horizon with schools, with the Plan Our Park, with the interest in jails and what to do in regards to them. Uh, a lot of things that are very serious issues that I think we need inspired leadership for. And I think based on my background and my interests, and my deep love and affection for this city, I think I would be a, a good candidate to field some of these issues and challenges. And I'm very excited at the prospect of it and would greatly appreciate your vote. Thank you, Paul. And finally, we'll hear from George Hirschman. Evening. George Hirschman. Probably uh, remember me as the uh, local meteorologist here. Uh, have since retired, and in my retirement, uh, it came to me that I really like Harrisonburg. And over the years that I've been here, this city has treated me very well, and I've been very impressed with uh, the way people uh, respond to uh, situations in this city, getting together as a community to write them and to help people out. Well, here's an opportunity for me to give back. Uh, and so that was the decision to run for city council. I think it's a very exciting time here in Harrisonburg. Uh, things are, uh, are growing, expanding. Uh, we have immigrant uh, uh, implosions uh, in the city. Uh, we've got uh, some school growth problems. Uh, we've got infrastructure that's expanding. Very exciting and very, going to very much change uh, the face of uh, Harrisonburg over the next years. It's going to take a lot of careful thought and consideration, and I think uh, to work together. On the, with the city board to make these uh, come to reality. I'm running as a, an independent uh, that I might keep my feet on both sides of the aisle. I think that that is, uh, is good for the area and certainly good for the input to a uh, city council. So I'm hoping that someplace along the way uh, you will give me your vote that I can uh, pursue my ambitions now to help shape this city as we uh, progress into the future. Thank you, George. Now we're going to start into the first round of questions. And this first uh, question, we will start with Dina Reed's response. The question is this. The trend in vibrant, growing cities is to expand biking and walking infrastructure. Cities always look for and borrow ideas from other cities. What other things that are being done in other places would you like to see Harrisburg include? And how will you help prioritize those? So Harrisonburg is the cycling capital of the Shenandoah Valley. We already represent all types and levels of cycling. Um, so we're already being an active and organized cycling community. Currently we are designated, um, I believe, as a bronze level in cycling and walking. However, just across the mountain, Charlottesville, it's, it's just a step up with the silver. Um, so in order for us to grow to that level, we need to have more state-of-the-art uh, cycling facilities. We need to ensure that there are more cycle education opportunities, specifically for seniors, immigrants, and refugees. And uh, for people like me who uh, haven't been on a bicycle since well, 1972, probably, uh, we need to ensure that cycling and walking are recognized and accommodated and funded as legitimate modes of transportation. Um, as city council member, I would certainly continue to support funding for our cycling and walking communities such as city council did with Connect Our Schools. Paul. Oh. I think I'd agree with Dina here, and I think our schools 
indicate that we don't have a whole lot of people riding bikes to school or walking to school, and I think that might be something we can change by bringing in more uh, accessible biking and walking paths. Uh, of course, you know, I have three children, and Harrisonburg could use a lot of improvement for our neighborhood, and I know for lots of other neighborhoods, and I think that being the outdoor, kind of culturally vibrant place that we are, we should prioritize this, and you know, it, it brings in tourism, it brings people down from Massanutten, it's something that we can give to our children and know that they're safe when they're going to school, and feel comfortable not just putting them on the bus, but putting them on a bike or putting them on their feet to get a little exercise and get to school and also just enjoy the beautiful city of Harrisonburg. George? Well, I'd be hard pressed to say anything against biking. I mean, it's just good. Been through many parts of Europe and it is uh, very much a biking world there. Uh, probably, uh, sometimes you see a lot more bikes than you will see cars. Uh, so, uh, yeah, very much for biking. Uh, it's healthy, it's good for the environment, uh, it's just a good transportation. I think one of the downsides of, of biking at this time is connectivity in the city. And we need to uh, let, uh, set up bike lanes that go someplace, that you can connect to go someplace else as opposed to just a, a ride in and a stop. Uh, but in all, it is very good. Uh, we should support any, uh, the biking community. And we have uh, the tourism uh, now with uh, bikes in the valley, which is also healthy uh, for both for the people and for our economy. Richard. Since a lot of people in the room already know this, but it's still worth saying, Harrisonburg has a bike and pedestrian plan. It's been through a number of iterations, and we're in fact working on an update right now. That affects how we approach things. We always want to be open to good ideas, and it's not like I or anyone else has thought of everything. But there is a structure already in place that lists projects and priorities, and it reflects stakeholder input. So for anyone with a great idea, the good news is that you're not starting from square one. But it does mean that a great place to start is to look at our existing plan and see how it might fit in there. Other good news is that we seem to be coming into a good period for grants, um, both because of uh, some more opportunities for funding for these types of projects and the fact that we're upping our game with the type of data that we're compiling that, appe that appeals to folks on the grant side. Uh, that's another sign for encouragement. And as for innovations that aren't a point of focus in our current planning, I confess I've always been intrigued by the idea of a bike sharing program. Don't necessarily know how or when we can pull it off, but I think it'd be cool. We'll go on to our next question then, and Paul, you'll start on this one. Question is this. A recent JMU study shows that we're facing a housing affordability dilemma in the Berg very soon, if not already. What zoning policies or planning actions could the city adjust that might help to ease that pressure for homeowners and renters? Well, I think the, the nature of this question is, is very complex and I think we would need to first reach out to the communities that are actually being the most affected by this situation and address it from there. I do know we have high densities of low income housing or Section 8 housing in Harrisonburg and I know a lot of people that, that feel like that should be more spread out to kind of help spread things a little more evenly so we're not creating these high density areas. And I think, you know, just back to the original idea of listening to the people that, that are having these problems and these issues and finding out ways to make sure that we're helping them as much as we can, making sure that people aren't discri using discriminatory practices when uh, renting properties and, and things like that become very important. And so I think we need to protect our residents that are having these issues because we have to serve all of them. George. Def definitely a problem uh, in the city for sure. Uh, I think one of the, the bigger problems is that a lot of the people who are moving into the city are lower income uh, in the lower income bracket and difficult for them to uh, afford housing here. We also have a large immigrant uh, population that is moving in and much the same problem folks as far as being able to afford uh, housing. Uh, mainly thinking there of owning uh, property as opposed to renting. But uh, the possibility might well be uh, to uh, adjust uh, property taxes for lower income people. 
uh, in order to help them uh, get a start as far as housing is concerned, uh, that is something that would have to be discussed. But there is a need to pay attention because uh, they, these are our people of the future and they need all the help that we can give them to uh, get started. Our Housing Redevelopment Authority has recently developed a fair housing plan for the city. There was a really good presentation of this at Council's August 9 meeting, and it was unanimously approved by Council on September 27th. For anyone interested in that, I direct you to our, our online. You can both see the plan and go see what we said about it. But most importantly, the city's biggest challenge over the next few years looks to be dealing with high school overcrowding and dealing with it in the context of a city that in just over a decade, the new high school was opened in 2005. This will be our sixth major education building. One reason for this is that we wanted to be the kind of community where people would be attracted to, and the data says we have been. But another part was short-sighted decisions made before I came on council that encouraged a glut of apartments being built in 2007 to 2009. So I confess that to the extent some pressure on affordable housing market is market-driven in that demands outracing supply, we still need to be cautious. The economic model the state government allows to cities just isn't likely to sustain the pace of population growth we've seen in recent years, and in some respects, that means our having to be cautious in supporting new housing over the near term. So as we all said, and, and we know affordable housing is uh, becoming a problem not only here but in the city, cities in Virginia. Uh, the cost to build a house or an apartment continues to go up as does the cost of living and incomes um, they are staying stagnant. I think we could look at it doing different things. We need to, of course, work together with JMU. Uh, they continue to develop a comprehensive plan to house their students. Uh, this will reduce the pressure on existing housing in the city to be converted to student, student housing. Uh, we could reward developers and homeowners who make important uh, improvement on existing structure especially in areas, areas of cities that are under-occupied. Uh, we know when you improve your neighborhood, uh, there will be a housing surplus. All right, we're on to our third question. George, you're gonna start this one. Are you concerned about climate change? If not, why? If so, what should local communities and governments like ours do to limit greenhouse emissions and adapt to their consequences. Yes, I am concerned about climate change. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, when you're looking at the disappearance of glaciers, uh, ocean temperatures rising, sea levels rising, uh, this is all going to work to change our climate, I think, somewhat drastically. We can do uh, a lot of things. Uh, we talked about biking before. Uh, we can talk about electric cars, solar panels, all kinds of wonderful things to uh, counteract uh, the climate change that's headed uh, this way. Uh, although, to caution you, I am not so sure in the long run that uh, these are going to have any great effect on the climate. But I think most of the things that we're trying to do to combat it are, are common sense. And it just makes sense to try them anyway. And then keep our fingers crossed that we get a bigger benefit out of it than uh, what we were anticipating. So yeah, I'm a little concerned about climate change, and I'm all for anything uh, that'll help uh, retard it. Richard, I'm very concerned about climate change. I'm something of a C-SPAN junkie, and I saw a presentation sometime in the last year. Sorry, I don't remember the presenter's name. Where the central point was the change is coming. Our actual choice is whether we're proactive in doing the things we need to do or we do that all too human thing where we ultimately do the right thing once all other possibilities have been exhausted. I'm on a multi-state board of local government officials that's advisory to the Chesapeake Bay Alliance. The big key there is local government environmental standards regarding Chesapeake Bay restoration have gone from being aspirational to mandatory. You just can't overstate the importance of standards moving from we'll get to this when we can to how are we going to do something now that we traditionally ignored? But that doesn't mean we just sit and wait. My fellow council Degner, Kai Degner, has led with my full support in an effort to create an environmental standards and advisory committee for the city. It's an informative stage. We're still taking applications through the end of the month from interested citizens. Once this committee is up and running, that should be a big step forward toward our looking at ways we can address these issues at the local level. Yeah. Yes, I believe in climate change, and yes, I'm concerned about it. Uh, climate change is impacting us here today, and it will not get better unless 
we start acting to slow it down or stop it. Uh, the things we can do locally are endless, more bike lanes to make transportation easier, cut energy usage or on our existing buildings. Uh, we can encourage residents to take advantage of the HEC's free energy audit program, which I knew nothing about until I started running for council. Uh, this is a great way to lower your utility bill and conserve energy. Uh, there is no single solution. However, we do know nearly every decision we make on a daily basis affects climate change. And Paul? Yes, I certainly think it's an issue as well, and I, and I do think it's an issue that's relative to greenhouse gases, and I think limiting those greenhouse gases is something that's very important and something that will redirect the, the weather patterns that we're seeing if we can do it soon enough. And you know, this is obviously a global problem, but I do think Harrisonburg could be a lead and set a really fine example for how to best incorporate green energy sources. And I think we've already come a long way in uh, the time that, that I've lived here and seen solar panels popping up and there's a wind turbine by, the, uh, by Thomas Harrison Middle School and things like that, that that I would be very supportive of and want to aggressively pursue for the city of Harrisonburg. We're on our final prepared question for this round, so as we listen to this one, you might want to start thinking about the questions that you all want to ask and start jotting them down. We'll be coming around to pick those up. So our fourth question this round, Richard, you'll start this. What's one unpopular decision you think needs to be made to shape Harrisonburg? How would you work to convince people that this decision will have positive benefits? One thing we know about human beings, and neuroscience and related fields only continue to compile more data that affirms this, is that as a group we're terrible prognosticators. As individuals, we also tend to think we're really good at it. Um, so with that disclaimer, and noting that truthfully the disclaimer applies to everyone in the room, I'll say I don't see decisions on the horizon that need to be made to shape Harrisonburg that I call unpopular, at least in the sense that there aren't others in town likely 